And good afternoon. Welcome to today's episode of Revolution Health. This is Dr. Jason Dean and coming to you live uh, with a friend of mine, uh, an amazing doctor. He practices in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Dr. Darren Schmidt, thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jason. Absolutely. And I mean, uh, just some accolades for you. you uh, you've been practicing many, many years. We'll get the whole rundown from you. But also you have developed quite the presence and helping a, a ton of people uh, via your YouTube channel. So really good stuff, man. Yeah, thanks. That's uh, another job right there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it absolutely, is. I totally understand. But uh, it's it just goes to show uh, the effort you put in, the quality and the value people get out of you. I want to dive in a little bit on some of your expertise because you've been doing this for so long. You've been studying nutrition for quite a while. Um, but give us a background on how you even got involved in this. And I, and I know there's a bit of a mold story behind that too, that a lot of people are going to get some value out of today. How I got involved in nutrition in the beginning? Yeah. Oh, so I was in chiropractic school in the mid nineties and I went to see Dr. Joel Wallach. And at the time his tagline was dead doctors don't lie. So I saw a seminar um, and after that night, I decided to be a nutrition based doctor because a nutrition based chiropractor, because, um, everybody's sick from food and that's like more of a, a cause, um, to, uh, help people out as best as possible. Yeah. That, may, that makes sense. And, and so not only did you do that, but it's always interesting because every time I interview a, a, a natural healthcare doctor, no matter what field it is in natural health, it's almost as if they've always had something themselves that they've had to get over or they've had to help get healed themselves, whatever it may be. And so you are kind of no, no different there in the fact that you've had some health challenges throughout life. And I believe you even grew up on a farm, um, but then you had some stuff in your old office mold and, and you know mold. So take us through a little bit of that. Yeah, well, I, you know, I just did a video just now. I'm gonna edit it and post it on my YouTube channel, telling the story about when I was poisoned with parathion. Growing up on the farm, I had a drop fall on my back. Oh, wow. And um, parathion has since been banned, thankfully. But it put me to sleep for 20 minutes. We had a neighbor a farmer that died from it. it. He had one drop fall on his boot, but it was concentrated and he ignored it because his boot was a thick leather, leather boot with a steel toe. My, the drop that fell on my back was uh, uh, diluted five parts parathion and 200 parts water. So it didn't kill me, but it put me to sleep. And I was poisoned from that. I had um, taken some detox supplements more than 10 years later. And my endurance in the gym and my physical strength doubled and quadrupled within two months of taking that supplement. Um, but, you know, I've had several, I always had a really pretty good constitution, but I had exposures like this pesticide and um, parasites. I got, I've had six parasites come out of me oh, since wow. probably 2007, but the mold started, I started getting um, symptoms from black mold poisoning in October of 2015 and then four, five months later, now I'm thinking I'm going to die. And it was settled in my heart and in my chest. I didn't know it was black mold. It took me nine more. So February 2nd of 2016 was the worst night of my life. I only slept three hours. My heart's racing, pounding. Um, my blood pressure is 155 over 95. And I can't catch my breath. I'm gasping for air. I'm thinking I'm, I'm having pain down my left arm, up my left face pain everywhere, cold. I'm thinking I'm having a heart attack, but my, I know my arteries are healthy. It took me nine months to find the mold in my office, which I've since moved out of. But um, that was quite an experience. And during that time of trying to find the cause, I discovered what I call the mechanism and do you want me to jump in on that? Yeah, yeah. I, so so on the I, there, there's a difference between, uh, I wanted to tell everyone this because it's so funny. I, I hear this every once in a while and, and you and I have talked about it. And, and people, um, I think, make a mistake between uh, keto acidosis and lactic acidosis. And you know about lactic acidosis. I think this is where you're going with that. So yeah. if this is lactic acidosis, absolutely. Let us know what lactic acidosis is and how this affected you. And now what you know about it. Yeah, so this is the mechanism of chronic disease, lactic acidosis. And it's the, it's the most common mechanism, I should say. And to be honest, one thing, a new thought that I've had in the last few months is that there, the definition of lactic acid, acidosis now is different than what it was 85 years ago. 
And I can see, depending on the decade, as I read through all these old books, the definition changed. And it used to be very clinically relevant and important for all the doctors. I mean, I have a book from the, from the 70s saying that every doctor has to look at lactic acidosis for every patient every day. That's how important it is. But now the definition is only applicable in two scenarios. But first of all, here's what, the, here's what it is. Lactic acidosis 85 years ago was too much lactate in the blood and other poisons. And they may or may not have been acidic, but they act like they were acidic. So basically it's dirty blood and that dirty blood um, crowds out the oxygen. So now you have too much, here's L for lactate going up. Here's O for oxygen. This is what happens. This makes the arteries dilate, which makes the capillaries also dilate and engorge with blood. Now the blood is dirty, it's toxic, and it's hypoxic. So the cells are trying to get um, oxygen and food from the capillaries, and they're also trying to dump their toxins into back into the blood. So this, the, the capillaries are engorged and stagnant. The cells become toxic and hypoxic, and the cells start to die. That's the mechanism of death. So you have a bunch of cells that are dying, and then the tissue dies, and then the organs die, and then your body dies. So now the definition of lactic acidosis is this. Um, too much lactate, and that's it. And now it applies only in two conditions. One, you have somebody that's got five days to live. And two, an athlete who just sprinted 200 yards and now they're two, or 200 meters and they're, now their muscles are, are sore and they got lactic acid in their muscles. So it's gone from a very clinically relevant and important subject that was studied for over 100 years up until 1960. And then after World War II, 1950, 1960, the definition started to change and now it's clinically irrelevant except for right before you die and if you're an athlete. So does that make sense what I just said? Yeah, no, it totally makes it. It almost seems like they they changed it as industrialization became more and more, which is interesting because they took the toxin part out, right? They took the toxin part out, yeah. And it's <laughs> it's I think it's sort of human nature to take a body of information. It's a big body of information to take a small part of it and try to, you know, work with that small part. And then the rest of it's forgotten. So, and this is true with like the Atkins diet. So Atkins was a cardiologist and he actually, he even had a cancer clinic and he's applying the same diet to everybody with great results. He did end up closing his cancer clinic because there's a few more things that he was missing. But later the Atkins diet became a weight loss diet. So, you know, it was like a big important thing and, and the media just took like, here's weight loss and let's, let's talk about that only. Wow. It, that, so that's a bit fascinating to me. And I, I want to dive into a little bit on that is because even though cancer, everyone knows about cancer being this horrible, horrible disease that's skyrocketing, really the number one is still cardiovascular disease. And so how would that play, how would the lactic acidosis point play into cardiovascular disease? Because that's still number one and so many people are suffering with it and they don't know it until they have the heart attack. Right. Yeah. It's Well, it's all the same mechanism, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, it's all lactic acidosis as defined in the 30s and 40s. So when you have um, the, let's see, the capillary engorgement from too much lactate, not enough oxygen, dirty blood, the cells start to die. When, mus when this happens in the heart, muscle cells, all muscle cells, when they die, they tighten up. And that's called rigor mortis. So you have a dead body laying on the ground. And after a few hours, now the whole body is stiff. Well, then after about 24 or 36 hours, the whole body gets really limp because the muscle tissue itself breaks down. So there's, there's lactic acidosis applied to heart pain, angina, and heart attacks. The lactic acidosis starves the muscle or a section of the muscle, and then that part dies, and then the heart starts to beat really weird. You get erratic heart, you know, heartbeats, irregular pulse, and if it's bad enough, the whole thing will die. Now, how does that apply to cancer? Cancer is also lactic acidosis. So when your cells are starving of oxygen, um, they start fermenting lactate. And they're, of course, they're fermenting sugar too. Um, but in the presence of oxygen, 
the cell should be able to get rid of the sugar and just burn fat. But when a cell is sick with not enough oxygen, you can add oxygen and the cell is still burning sugar and it's still burning lactate. That's, that's disease right there. That's the lactic acidosis. So that's why you want to get into ketosis. You want to exercise your cells so that they don't require sugar and they don't, they're not using lactate as fuel anymore. Instead, they're burning fat. So it's all, it's all the same mechanism. And the solution is the same. The solution is get into ketosis, burn fat, burn ketones, and clean the body out. Make sure that there's no toxins in the body, in the blood, et cetera. Yeah, and I want to dive into the ketogenic aspect here one second. Before we dive into that, though, um, we we're talking about these toxins. And what, what are you saying are the biggest toxins people are dealing with? They were in a toxic environment, obviously. But what would you say are the top things that people are looking at that they that are dealing with from a toxin standpoint? Well, I consider sugar a toxin. Okay. So sugar is number one. Number and then one. when you look at, he then you got these two broad categories of heavy metals and chemicals. So heavy metals, it depends on your exposures in your past, but it could be lead, it could be mercury, it could be cadmium. You know, if you're a carpenter or something, touching nails all the time with bare fingers, it could be that. And then in the chemical world, there's, uh, you could have a chemical, it depends on like your childhood and what you've been exposed to around the household. It could be household cleaners um, or where you work. It could be if you're working like in a car wash, it could be car exhaust. So it's a wide variety. And you know, babies are born with like 200 chemicals in their blood. And you know, and over a hundred of them are, t are toxic. So there's, you know, a lot of different potentials there. That's incredible. And you even said too, you said earlier, you had gotten rid of at least several parasites out of your body, which technically is another toxin, but it's, it's an immune challenge. Um, but something that so many people are dealing with. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dr. Oz one time said that 90% of Americans have parasites and it, it just so happened that at the time I really figured out parasites really well. I think the year was 2007 and and I was thinking about probably 80% of Americans have parasites based on my study, like in my clinic, in my, with my patient base, you know, we figured out how to get parasites out really well. And they started bringing in jars and bags of parasites. And it's like, oh my gosh. So yeah, 80, 80 to 90% of people have parasites. And now the question is, is it negatively affecting your health to the degree that you are suffering? And the answer could be yes or no. But regardless of that, I have people, they're pooping out parasites and it's fixing their intestinal problem, their colitis, their fatigue, you know, their hair loss, all that stuff. <laughs> That's awesome, man. And, and now I do want to transition into something I know you're very, very uh, connected to because, you know, I, I don't think you're a vegan or vegetarian, are you? No, <laughs> we're, I'm not. We're going we're gonna to dive into the ketogenic diet because I, I know you've had your, your share of vegan and uh, vegetarian haters. But, but take us into some of the basics that you've learned and you understand now about ketogenic diet and some of the things you're eating. Because I know you're, I'm joking, but I know you're not vegan or vegetarian. And I, and I know you've had plenty of people attack you through uh, whether it be your channel or anything like that because there's haters out there. But take right. us through what you've seen in that because obviously it's the big thing on the corner. Everyone's talking about it. I don't think everyone does it correctly. And there's also gradients to it. Right. Yeah, there's, that's a, a big subject. So the um i think that the ketogenic state physiological state is the native state of the body and so at a bare minimum should people should be in ketosis like four times a year just to exercise your cells to be burning ketones and to get rid of extra fat and then i have i say i say this to patients and i start them off into ketosis i get them in and out of ketosis a few times in the first three months and then um I say to them, okay, now we have to decide how often you should be in ketosis. If they have heart disease or cancer, they're going to be in it most of the time. And then even some people who are pretty healthy, they like being in ketosis. They feel better that way. So then they're in ketosis, maybe let's say three weeks out of four or five days out of seven. So it's, so when you look at our ancestors, all these native tribes had animal meat in some way, whether it was fish or ruminant animals. Um, there was no vegan tribe ever in the history of our humanity, according to Dr. Weston Price, who spent 10 years 
He traveled the world in the 1930s and he looked at 134 indigenous tribes. There's no vegan tribe. Um, so, but you look at hunters and they would have meat and they'd wake up in the morning and go hunting for the day. They'd have one meal a day and they had great endurance and physical strength and good reflexes. And that's all ketosis. And if you're burning sugar all the time, you lose your endurance, you lose your strength, you lose your reflexes, you lose your brain power, your ability to think through a process. And then you lose your bones and you lose your teeth. You know, so ketosis keeps your body strong and you can't have, uh, you, you got to make sure you have enough protein. So how do you get into ketosis? Um, there's a really, you know, I used to teach it in a way that was a bit complicated. That was taught originally by the Mayo Clinic for epilepsy. And it still works. We've had people, we've had 11 people reverse their cancer with ketosis. And of course, diabetes, that's easy to get rid of, type uh, 2 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes is very controllable with ketosis. But um, there's several ways to do it. I mean, you could just um, not eat food. And on the third day, you're in ketosis, just doing a fast. You could do a fasting mimicking diet. Um, you can eat the ketogenic uh, diet. You can um, do intermittent fasting with ketogenic foods. But, you know, there's a really simple way to do it. And that's just eat meat and cheese and eggs and, like, and dairy. These are animal foods that have that ratio, maybe 70% fat, 30% protein, like a steak. That's a ketogenic food right there. Plus the red meat has carnitine, and, uh, which drives fat into the mitochondria to facilitate ketosis. Um, what else do you want me to say about this? <laughs> oh, that's impressive. So, so, so what do you eat like on a given day? Cause I think one of the people, uh, one of the problems people have, and I, and I know I've seen this is, um, everyone wants to do something, but they're like, Oh, well, do I need this big cookbook? And I don't know what to cook and plan, et cetera. I know you're a busy guy. Like what is like food in a day of Dr. Darren spent like, well, you know, when I ate the older version of the ketogenic diet, um, I would go after olives and different nuts and seeds, and I would uh, certainly eat meat. And I'd try to find ketogenic foods by doing math using various apps and stuff. But now it's just, I just eat meat. And I mean, I still have some plants. I Like I have a salad sometimes, but I put cheese on it and the salad becomes ketogenic. Um, so if you just eat meat, you'll be in ketosis. And it's like old school Atkins. And he got his diet with, from the thing called a diet called the protein sparing modified fast from Indiana University from the mid 1960s. He just took that diet and he put his name on it and uh, sold his book. So and there's older books, too, from from even the late 1800s where doc, where people were saying, look, just eat meat. It'll help you, you know, like it'll get you healthier, get rid of your diabetes and stuff. So. And now, and so meat has been, has, has a bad reputation and that's because of bad science and people with an agenda to try to get you to not eat meat. Do you want to go into that? That's Oh pretty- yeah. So, so, so you got, so now that you've gone down that road, you got to give me that. What, 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 tell us what that means. Okay. So in nutrition research, there's basically two types of science. There's observational studies and then there's experiments. So there's other words for observational studies. There's epidemiological studies, uh, cohort studies. And over the last 100 years, 110 years, there seems to be what happens to be two groups of people. Okay, one group is, is called the adheres, and the other group of people is called non-adheres. Non-adheres do not listen to their doctor. They eat whatever they want. They eat more meat. They eat more junk food. They smoke, they drink alcohol, they don't exercise, they're overweight, they don't wear their seatbelts, and they play with guns, and they take more risks. Okay, and then you have the other people who are adherers. They wear their seatbelt, they don't smoke, they don't drink, they exercise, they're normally thinner, and they eat beans, and they avoid meat because their doctors tell them to avoid meat. So having said that, when you look at those two groups of people, um, you can't say that meat is bad and you can't say that beans are good. There's just too many factors. So that's epidemiology. It always turns out that the meat eaters 
are overweight and they don't live as long as the thin people who eat beans. But that doesn't mean that meat is bad. It doesn't mean that beans are good. So you got to take this information from these observational studies and you send it to other researchers that have more money and more manpower to experiment. So here's an experiment. You take two random uh, groups of people, randomized groups, and you tell this group right here to reduce your meat intake by 20%. And then you follow them for years. And it turns out, and they've done this, and it turns out that these people do not have less heart disease, less diabetes, and less cancer. That one experiment, that trial negates 110 years of observational studies. So just looking is not enough. You get a hypothesis from looking, and then you got to do a test to experiment with it. So, so that right there says that meat is not bad. Now, when you look at the nutritional factors in meat and the physiology of our bodies and the physiology of our muscles, meat is actually a superfood. It's more of a superfood than kale and avocados and spinach and green smoothies. It's healthier for you than, than plants in general. So, and I'm not saying to avoid plants, you know, you can, what you do, here's what you do. You eliminate grains, you eliminate sugar, and you, you end up with fruits and vegetables and meat. And the question is how much fruit and vegetables do you want versus how much meat do you want? And you go back and forth and you experiment and you might feel better with more vegetables or you might feel better with more meat. So it's up to you, like depending on how your body responds. That's pretty profound right there. That's, that's major for everybody. And now have you gone full carnivore? Um, I've been working more towards that and I have had a few days, I don't know, probably six days in the last four weeks where I just eat nothing but meat. And it's been great. My strength at the gym is better. My brain, brain power all day. Sleep is better. Like I fall asleep and it seems like one minute later I'm awake. Um, I just, I'm, my body definitely loves red meat. So yeah, it's been fantastic for me, but it may not be fantastic for everybody, you know, and different people need different types of meat, right? Like chicken, which is more white meat. People, some people like that more. So it's, it's all, it's all like a N equals one experiment. Like how does your body respond? That makes a lot of sense. And I want to, I want you to tell a story. I'll, I'll remind you what it is because I, I know a lot of people out there and, and trust me, this is going to go up on your YouTube page. So you're going to get some of the vegans and vegetarians coming out. And one of the things I've heard more on my end from the, the haters in that world is that we were never intended to digest and break down meat because of our digestive system. But I want you to tell real quick the story that you told me uh, probably a couple months ago, which was regarding um, the basically cavemen, animals, and the skulls and the vertebrae that goes through the digestive system. Oh, yeah. That? Yeah, this is an experiment done at the, through the Smithsonian Institute. And what they did is they found an, in an archaeological dig a gathering of bones. And what was weird was that, like, like little mice bones were um, the skull was partially eroded away. And they came to the conclusion that our ancestors would, let's say they get a bird or a mouse or a rat or something, and they would kill it and they would take um, the animal itself and they would crush it with a rock. So they would soften the insides of it and they would just eat the whole thing. So in the, bowel movements there were feathers and there were bones and fur and so let's say you had a mouse like most of the vertebrae were gone and maybe there would just be one or two vertebrae and then most and then um most of the skull was still there but it was gone it was like our bodies would so these researchers this is back in the 60s these researchers at the smithsonian did it to themselves they just ate whole rats or whole mice and then they would collect their poop for three days. And that's what they found out is that like our bodies, our digestive system, our stomach was so acidic, it would erode the bones and the fur would come out or the feathers would come out because we don't need that. But that's the story on that. That's what our ancestors used to do, just eat the whole animal. And it shows that our digestive system is capable of breaking down something as strong as a really the toughest tissue we have in the body. So it was actually breaking it down, which means most likely I'm assuming from this is one that we can eat that stuff, but two, 
our, our bodies have kind of become weaker because we're not putting that kind of thing through our body anymore. Right. If you grow up eating cereal and grains and stuff, you're going to mess up your gallbladder and then you can't digest the fat. You're going to weaken your stomach. You get ulcers, you get heartburn. So you can't erode those bones away. But you know, if you grab a chicken, if you have a drumstick and you got the soft cartilage on the top of that drumstick, you just grab onto that, chew that down, get the collagen from there. I mean, you can work your way back up. Your pH of your stomach should go, go all the way down to 1.0. Very, very acidic. Wow. Wow. Well, before we head out, I have, I have one more, one more physiological question, I guess I'd ask you is there the, the last argument that people make and, and I, and you and I are in the same side of this, but I want, I want to get your take for everybody as well is we're in a world of supplementation now because one, how sick people are one because of different things, toxins, et cetera. Um, but what do you see from a nutritional standpoint and a supplementation standpoint, whether it's organ meats, um, just vitamins, minerals, et cetera, and, and how people, need it now because there's still that argument out there well we can just get it through the food but is that even really true oh no i don't think it's true um i mean and even if it were true why not supplement with you know with good pills that will help benefit your body but we our, our world is so toxic P people ask me all the time well, where did i get this toxin from and my answer is you live on planet earth you know like not too far from where i live there's these open pit mines. It's just gravel, but you know, they kick up minerals and they kick up toxins. There's mercury in the land and that becomes a vapor and it goes up into the air, 20,000 feet in the air. And it goes across over to New York state or Pennsylvania and it rains and it comes down. So that's what happens. All the coal, you know, every day in China, every new day, there's one more new, coal burning power plant in China. And that's just mercury that's going up in the air. So you should be, I think people should be detoxing most of the year and you just do a little bit every day. Um, I was just saying that I had, I just did a video about this too. I have a guy, he's been with me for about six or eight weeks and he had tinnitus. I put him in ketosis and the tinnitus was gone immediately. Wow. And we wanted to sus sustain that result. So I I have them on three products. Two of them are for detoxification. Well, one of them, I put him on it like three weeks ago. I saw him last week and he said he's got headaches now. He's got pressure in his head now and his poop is black and smelly. And I was like, yes, that's fantastic. You're detoxing. It's coming out of your brain. That one product I put him on crosses the blood brain barrier, grabs onto garbage and pulls it out. And so he'll be doing this for, you know, maybe three months or six months. Or maybe a year. I don't know. I don't know how toxic it is. We'll let his body tell us. But um, yeah, that's just an example of like what can happen when you're detox when you're detoxifying. And it's a, the type of product he's on. It's it's a binder. It's a special dirt. That's what I call it. Special dirt. So I mean, are you going to go out in your garden and eat, and eat dirt and try to detoxify that way? No, no not really. <laughs> yeah, it so makes sense. That, he, oh, yeah, and, and he probably he probably thinks that he was sick. Or I mean, I'm sure you educated him on it, but. But the majority of people that are going through, I've done videos on this, that, that they think that they're actually sick when in reality they're detoxing and now they're having to re-experience some of the stuff that went through their body the first time and now that they're putting out to a detox channel. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's, that's fascinating. Now you, now, you do live up in the northern area of the U.S., up in Michigan. Do you see differences in things up there in maybe your region? I mean, obviously, I'm down here in Florida. We see crazy, strange things that seem like they only come from here. Do you see similar things up there? I know you get less sun, obviously, because of the snow and things like that. Do you see differences in patients up there? Well, I've never practiced in the South, so I don't really know. So you, you don't, you don't but really I'm know. a fan of D. I'm certainly a fan of vitamin D. But you know, one thing that's interesting is like, so I'm in the air, I'm near Detroit. So I have a lot of patients that work for Ford, Chrysler, GM. And you know, bef before the recession of 2008, Ford started laying people off, you know, and then during the recession, I saw huge stress. So that's an economic factor. But as far as like the environment, I mean, um, you know, across the United States, most people are deficient in vitamin D because we live inside and we work inside. You know, so that's a factor there for vitamin D. That, that makes sense. And, and so before we head out, what, what's a parting message from you in your education, your experience, your, your constant 
you know, thirst for knowledge um, to, to everyone out there. I mean, it, it, a lot of people are not even awake to that they're unhealthy. Um, what are the things you see? What, what's kind of a message from you? Oh, geez. Um, my message. Well, if you check out my YouTube channel and learn the mechanism of chronic disease, that was my greatest discovery in my career. When I figured that out, actually, it was April of 2016. I did a few videos on it. Everything made sense. All aspects of healthcare. Why do medications make people worse? Why do medications help people feel better but hasten death? Why do why does oxygen work like supplemental oxygen? Why do greens work? Why does ketosis important? You know, why is burning sugar all the time bad? It all it's all wrapped up in lactic acidosis. So if you figure that out, if you understand that, now you can make decisions on your healthcare that would actually benefit you. And then ketosis is one of the solutions for lactic acidosis. So that's another goal is to get into ketosis. Now, if you have black mold like I did, or if you have um, some sort of, um, you know, candida, there's other conditions that can make ketosis difficult. You got to work your way into ketosis. Everybody, if you have a human body, you got to get into ketosis sometimes. So that's my, my, that's my other message. So lactic acidosis and ketosis, and ketosis is really the right. party message and, and how you can actually get mm -hmm. healthy once and for all. That, that makes a lot of sense. It's, it's, it seems like health, as much as we complicate it, really does break down to simplicities. Right. And then, and I, I'd have to say this too. So I started eating more carnivore beginning about four or five months ago. And at the time, I was only eating red meat twice a week. And I've known for a couple decades that red meat is my body's favorite food. But when I started going more carnivore, now we're talking red meat every day, at least once, more like twice a day. And the tremendous benefit that I got, but if I look back like five, six months ago, I was under the, I was sort of under the control of the vegan agenda. You know, like it's spread through all the medical system, nutritionists, dietitians, uh, school lunches, military, you know, universities, they're all saying meat is bad. So I'm like embarrassed that I was influenced by that. And I just, re you know, I just discovered this like four or five months ago. So eating red meat, depending on your body, is a, a beneficial thing. And it's like if, if there was an agenda to wipe out humans and to make us sick and to make us stupid, how would you do that? You would take away the most important food and you would give the worst food. So take away red meat, add soy, add sugar, add processed garbage, you know, like, so I'm a fan of humanity. I like humans and I want humans to be strong and smart and powerful. And I think red meat's part of that, part of that uh, e uh, equation. <laughs> I love it. That makes a ton of sense. Now, a lot of people are watching this. People are going to see it all over the world, just like in your YouTube channel. YouTube channel. Where do people scout you out? Where do they contact you? How do they get to you? Um, give us your details. All right. Well, my favorite social media is YouTube. I got a channel. Um, just search my name on YouTube. You're searching Darren Schmidt ketosis. And uh, that's <laughs> an interesting subject. And then my, and then my, I got other companies. I got this office. Um, the website is, the name is the Nutritional Healing Center of Ann Arbor. So it's the website is the NHCAA.com. I have a supplement company called Heritage Glandulars. You can search that. It's a multi yes, Please plug that. Please plug that. I plug your, your two other companies are phenomenal. I don't want to leave those out. And I totally kind of forgot about it. <laughs> plug, plug your protein bar company and your supplement company because they are, they are excellent. Thanks. The um, supplement company, we, we only have one product right now, but I'm working on more. It's nine glands, including pituitary, uh, thymus gland. It's got heart. And so it's a multiglandular. The point of this, people take a multimineral. They take a multivitamin. This is a multiglandular. And it's not designed to be taken every day. You don't want to take it every day because that would be detrimental because our ancestors would eat glands sometimes. So do like, you know, do it for a month and then stop it for two months. The other uh, company is... Good Fat Bar. The website is goodfat.bar. So we have six different food bars. The base is cacao butter, and three of them are keto facilitating, and the other three are low carb, higher fat. And my favorite flavor is dark chocolate peanut. 
fantastic. So, so when I applied, this is an interesting thing. I applied with the United States Patent and Trademark Office for a cacao based food bar and it wasn't a category. They had nut based, they had protein based that, you know, so I had to create a whole new category and they allowed that. And then we applied for the name. So yeah, the good fat dot bar um, website. And we, we also have for doctors, we have power nutrition practice. So we consult doctors, we train them on how to run uh, the business of a nutrition practice and then the clinical, some clinical stuff too. Nice. Awesome. And his, the, the heritage glandulars are tremendous. Um, it's, they actually taste good too, which is strange for all of us weirdos who like those types of things. Um, the good fat bar. So I will, so I will actually promote this is I only promote stuff that I actually use. Um, but the good fat bar is, is so delicious. I'm a big fan of the banana, banana nut bread. Um, but it's so good. And like, I have one or two of those and I'm like good for into the middle afternoon. Sometimes they, they are phenomenal. But, um, the one thing I love about you is you are, you're constantly researching, you you're gaining knowledge. And then you actually put out these products that, you know, there's, you go into a health food store today, like say whole foods. And there's literally, it seems like 50 feet of protein bars and good luck finding one that doesn't have either way too much sugar or just trash in it. And, I mean, yours and only one other one do I actually really like that have legitimate nutrition in them. So um, it's nice to have someone out there actually working for human beings. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we were consulted at a university who they do food packaging. And one of their one of their professors was retiring, but we had this meeting with her. And she said, well, you, your protein powder should be soy. And at the time, we we're using pea protein. And she goes, why don't you use soy? And I said, well, you know, it's got a bad reputation. It's not good, et cetera. And she goes, yeah, but there's no proof to back that up. And I was like, it doesn't matter because people think that is bad. I think it's bad. And then right. later, like a few hours, like an hour later, she said, you should use um, rice syrup for your sweetener. And I, and I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And she goes, why not? And I said, because it's rice syrup. You know, like for 30 years, she's been telling all these food manufacturers to use soy, to use rice syrup, to use chemicals for stabilizing, chemicals for preserving, chemical. This is why all this garbage is in all these health food stores because they're getting consulting from the same people who are experts, you know, but they're, they don't know the truth about health and good nutrition. So I had to like, you know, do my own research and figure out like what is really good to make a food bar. That makes complete sense. Well, thank you for doing that. And thank you for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. People gain a lot of value. And uh, I think you're the first person that's ever dove into it with me on um, not only just like toxin toxicity, but also ketogenic and carnivores. So I appreciate that because a lot of people, a lot of new information for people who may have been confused on that. So really great stuff. Yeah. I appreciate you being on today and uh, have a great one, man. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. Uh, thank you for having me, Jason. And everyone go out and share this. Go to Dr. Darren Schmidt's YouTube page. Again, just um, either Google or go up and in the YouTube and search his name, Darren Schmidt or Dr. Darren Schmidt Ketosis. It's all there. It'll pop up. It'll even show you his website to his uh, office and goodfat.bar, uh, heritage glandulars, right? That's what it was yeah. called. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and in power nutrition practice. So check those all out. It's phenomenal information. And again, thank you for being with us. Enjoy the cool temperatures up in Ann Arbor today. All right. Thanks, Jason. Take care. All right. Thank you for joining us at Revolution Health today. Everyone signing off. Share this out there to the world so we can help flip the healthcare paradigm and make America healthy again. Dr. Jason Dean, Revolution Health. Bye-bye.